All right. right, Marcus, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And thank you everyone for coming. This is by far the biggest post-pandemic crowd I've had at a user group, so thank you so much for coming. Um, we will be doing a whole lot of live coding today, so if you feel like you can't see the screen right now, that would be a good time to move closer or find a seat. Um, but yeah. So today we're gonna talk about building full stack web applications by combining a Spring Boot backend with a React front end. I actually gave this talk at DevNexus two weeks ago and when the schedule came out, they had me and Venkat in the rooms next to each other. And I'm like, well, nobody's gonna show up so I might as well like go home. But they moved him away. But before I no noticed that, I added a couple of extra things in here just to make it a little bit more interesting on that schedule. So since we're probably gonna have a lot of time here, I'm the only speaker. We'll also take a look at playing around with ChatGPT. We're gonna build a chat application, so we might as well bring in another participant. And we're gonna be playing around with GraalVM. So we're gonna take our completed application, we're gonna compile it to native image and just see what that looks like, how we can boot up a Spring Boot application in a couple of milliseconds. So it's gonna be more of a freeform live coding experience type of thing. There will be mistakes. I will expect you all to tell me what went wrong when no, nothing compiles. And uh, yeah, so pay attention. <laughs> all right, um, so my name is Marcus. I've been working for the past two decades in this kind of intersection between Java and the web. So always been kind of building my backends with Java, always been building my front ends with web technologies. And it's been just a very kind of interesting journey seeing how both of these ecosystems have evolved and I remember back in the day the Java front end ecosystem used to be like literally the wild west like it, I could spend like 80% of my time just trying to get everything to work in different browsers and I'm happy to report that that has significantly improved so if you haven't done any front end stuff in a while it's not going to be as scary as it may have been back in the day when you tried it. I work as the VP of Developer Relations at Vaughn, which means that I'm essentially in charge of our developer experience. So I try to both help people find our tools. I speak to a lot of developers to understand kind of what works, what doesn't work, what could we make better. Um, and we just spend a lot of time also with the products team, just try to kind of push for things that we know will make that developer experience better. So. Our products are open source Apache licensed products. So we have a kind of a big community around it, uh, active on Discord and Stack Overflow and just places discussing. So we want to be kind of involved in all of that. Uh, you can find me on Marcus Helberg on most of the platforms if you want to reach out or if you have questions later on or want to tweet pictures or, or anything from today's talk. Uh, Speaking of that, I have been trying this new thing recently. So if you have a phone with you, you are able to join in here and we're gonna do a couple of polls where you can all join in and answer some questions. So I wanna understand who am I, who am I speaking with today? What's your background? And that's gonna help me also kind of, kind of hone in on the right things when we're getting to the live coding part. So you can use the QR code or you can use the instructions here and once you get in, you can press the little thumbs up button and hopefully I'll start seeing a couple of you coming in here. I'll leave the instructions up here uh, as we go. So if you didn't catch it already, you'll be able to join later on. All right. I see still a couple of cameras up there. So we'll wait for just a minute here. And besides answering polls, this actually turned out to be a good tool also for asking questions. So if you have a question that you feel more comfortable asking in text, feel free to write it in. And that way also you won't forget it by the time we get the questions and answers. So feel free to use that. Obviously feel free to ask me in person since we are uh, in a place where we can ask questions in person. All right, so let's start by just understanding what kind of developer you would identify yourself as primarily. So would you say that you're a backend developer, a full stack developer, or a front end developer who somehow got lost and ended up in a Java user group? <laughs> okay, so we 
<laughs> seem to have a, a slight. <laughs> All right. Um, so certainly more backend developers than people doing full stack, but still a very kind of big portion of people doing full stack. And we do have at least two people doing front end. So welcome to you as well. For you, I'll try to explain the Java parts, I guess. Thanks, sir. All right, very good. So in terms of languages, what are the languages that you're working with and you're kind of comfortable working with? Java, Kotlin, TypeScript, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. These are all languages that we might be working with today. So Java is in a lead, which is good. <laughs> And we have a pretty, almost the kind of same amount of people are either familiar with TypeScript or JavaScript, so that's good. We have that one token Kotlin person as well, so that's good. All right, I think this is a good, good kind of foundation for what we're going to be working with today, because we're going to be working with Java on the back end. We're going to be working with TypeScript on the front end. If you're not familiar with TypeScript, you've done JavaScript. I'll teach you. It's very kind of straightforward. It's <laughs> Well, even even JavaScript has classes these days, but it's essentially just a, an extension of the language that provides typing. But it does it in a very kind of unobtrusive way, where it is able to infer most of the types. So it's mostly it looks like JavaScript, but but you actually get compile time warnings and hints for stuff that you're doing. Perfect. Um, on the backend side of things, are you using Spring Boot, Jakarta EE, or any of its predecessors like Java EE? Quarkus, Micronaut, Node, something else, PHP maybe. <laughs> All right. It's like Spring Boot is very well used around here and several people using Node as well. Very nice. And one PHP. Two. <laughs> Perfect. All right, and then the final one before we get to the actual stuff. So in terms of front end stuff, so if you are one of these people who are doing front end or full stack development, what are you using today? Are you using React, Angular, Vue, Lit, Vaadin maybe? Okay. Very cool. So it seems like React has a slight lead, but Angular and Vue are quite kind of on par with each other. It's interesting, like, I've noticed that in a lot of companies using Java on the back end, Angular tends to be very popular just because it's sort of like Java EE for front end, like with dependency injection and all kinds of patterns that people are used to from the Java world. But it seems like React is kind of taking slowly over some of those projects as well. Very cool, well thank you for that. So it seems like there's a big group of people here who are familiar with both Spring Boot and React, so that gives us a good baseline. And if I need to explain something, maybe you can help me out with that. All right, so let's imagine a situation where you are building an application. This is a very simple application and uh, essentially has a backend here on the dark background. You have a person model with first name, last name, and address. You have a get mapping, so essentially you're returning a REST response, just a JSON with a list of people. And then on your front end here, we have some React code. If you don't speak React, what this does is it takes the collection of people, and for each person, it outputs a list item with the first name and last name. And all is well, this works. But then a few weeks later, Bob comes along and it's a Friday afternoon. Bob is very thirsty. He has some plans with his friends, so he needs to get some last minute changes in before heading out. And too bad for me, uh, my, my model was not really up for what he was doing. So he decided to kind of simplify the person here, just kind of changing the first name and last name to be a name. And he fixed his code, but because this rest endpoint here essentially just outputs JSON. He didn't notice that my code was expecting that JSON to contain other information. 
and he goes out as a great time with his friends and two o'clock next afternoon he wakes up to a lot of angry calls from his boss because he broke code in production so obviously it would have been very nice if we would have been able to kind of get this type safety net that we're so used to when we're working on Java code on the back end to extend also to the entire application and the front end. So when he went and changed code, it would have actually said, hey, you're about to break code in these places as well, and you might want to do something about that. So that's the kind of general idea of what we're trying to do when we're combining Java with TypeScript. We want to make sure that like the entire application is sort of uh, within the same type safety net so that we can have a more it, it's it's both good for situations like this where somebody might refactor your code later on but we'll also notice that it's super handy when we're building the application because now we don't have to have a separate browser window open where we're look, reading at like swagger docs to understand what apis there are we can just use the autocomplete to explore apis so it also makes the actual building of the application quite a lot nicer so we built this uh, open source framework called Hilla, and what it does essentially, it takes a Spring Boot backend, a React frontend, and applies a little bit of magic in between to make them play really nice together. So essentially what we try to do is we wanna make it really easy to build these larger, more complex, more meaningful applications. A lot of frameworks tend to kind of uh, focus on making it easy to build a Hello World app but our customers tend to be businesses building business applications with a lot of grids and forms and hundreds of views and stuff. And those tend to be kind of diff different to build. Uh, not only are they much more complex, you can't spend like weeks building a single view, you have to build it in like a day, but then you also have to maintain it for five years and not like two weeks. So we wanna kind of build both for kind of developer productivity so you can build these views quickly and also have this type safety, which makes it easier to maintain them for a longer period of time. To help you uh, out with this, we have a big library of UI components, so all the kind of different building blocks you might need when you're building an application from text fields and button all the way up to like data grids and charts and dialogues and menus and things like that. So really kind of in summary, what it does is it gives you the components and this Java to TypeScript generation. It has a way of sharing validations between the server and the client. So if you have a validation on your Java object, you can kind of have those validations be performed in the UI. So people are able to see that they're doing a mistake, but then the framework is going to revalidate that on the kind of save back to the server. So again, kind of removing some of the overhead that you'd have to take care of yourself otherwise. We support using both React and Lit on the front end. So we're, today we're gonna focus in on React specifically, but if you're really kind of into web components and, and building more like on the bare metal of the browser, you can certainly use Lit as well. And as mentioned, this is a Apache 2 licensed project. So everything that we're gonna be working with here today is, is open source that you can play around with it as much as you want. All right, it's a lot of talking, so I think we need to offset that with a lot of coding. Before we get to coding, can everyone give me a thumbs up if you can see the code here? Do we need to bump it up a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. A little bit? Okay. So the newest version of IntelliJ finally came out with a zoom for the entire ID, which is super handy because before I could make this text a lot bigger, but all of the sidebars would still be tiny and nobody could see like this, like I was pointing at a file and it's like you literally need a binoculars to see it. Okay, so here I have a project that I've created. The way you create a Hilla project is by using a CLI that we have. So you can use it through MPX and Hilla CLI in it, say that you want to use React and then give your uh, project a name because I didn't know really what kind of Wi-Fi I'm going to be working with. I already did this ahead of time. And if we look at what we have here, you'll notice that we have a Spring Boot project. It's a Maven project with a POM file. 
and it is a Spring Boot project. Like I said, we're using Spring Boot 3, which is the new version of Major of Spring Boot that just came out, and that's going to allow us to play around with Growl VM a little bit later here. And to that, we've only essentially added a Hilla dependency and the Hilla Spring Boot uh, starter dependency. So in our project, we have the source folder, which contains the entire backend of the application. This is the Spring Boot application. And this is what we can run to start our application. Now what's nice with Hilla is that it takes care of both the front end and the back end build in one. So we don't have to start a separate front end and back end build server. It will start both at the same time and regardless of where we change code, it will make sure that the browser gets updated, just showing all that new code. Then we have this other folder here called front end. This is our front end application, the React application. So in here we have a index HTML and then we have a view here, which is where we're gonna be spending most of our time today. So a React component is essentially a JavaScript function that returns JSX. JSX pretty much looks like HTML, but it is uh, actually compiled JavaScript. So it allows us to inject JavaScript or TypeScript in this case into that template. And like I said, we have this front end build tooling always listening for changes. So if I say hello, there and save, it will automatically immediately show up there, which makes it kind of nice as we're building stuff, we can sort of see what's happening as we're, as we're working. Okay, so as the name here might already give you a little bit of a hint at what we're gonna build today, we're gonna build a chat application. It's a pretty simple example, but it allows us to build kind of an application that deals with reactive data types. So we want to be able to have several people listening in on the same set of messages coming through. And that's kind of a, an easy enough kind of domain for everyone to understand. So we're going to begin our application by going to the back end here and creating a way for us to connect or kind of fetch data from the back end. And I'm going to create a new Java class here. I'm going to call this my chat endpoint. And this is something that's Hilla specific. So if you have a class and you add a endpoint annotation to it, and in this case, I'm also gonna say anonymous allowed because we're not gonna be setting up spring security in this talk. That would be a whole different talk. <laughs> so we have, a, we have an endpoint here. What this means essentially is that all the public methods that we have here will be kind of Hilla will generate TypeScript methods with the same signature for us to call from the client. And let's do a little bit of a data model that we can work with here, and I'll show you what that means in practice. So I'll create a record here called message, and the message record will have a couple of things. So we'll have a string for the username, and we'll have a string for the text, and then we'll have a instant for the time time that it was sent like this and let's see if this works instant, instant is a java class yeah it's uh java.time okay so we're gonna do a public list of messages for now and Let's make sure that we get the right import here. Get messages. And cheating here, using a Copilot to help actually create a few messages for us. Mark, but, can I talk about time for just a second? Yeah. Um, so for those of you who have been around since Java 1 or like I have, the uh, instant the newer version of kind of Java util date without all of the extra weight of formatting and calendars and stuff. So the instant is representative of a specific time, and then you use a calendar to format that into whatever you want with perhaps a time zone to make it how you want. So instant is kind of the make it moment. 
one, right? Very good extra. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so what I did here is I built my application. IntelliJ requires you to kind of actually hit build. If you're on VS Code or Eclipse, it actually does that when you save. But what that does is it actually creates a bunch of generated code here for us, which is going to be helpful for us. So uh, it's actually something is. Oh, sometimes IntelliJ is a little slow to pick up changes on the on the file system, so I thought it didn't generate everything, but it actually did. So if we go into our chat view here, what I want to do now is define a state that will contain all the messages in our chat, and then we're going to bind it here. So React, as the name implies, is a reactive library. The way that looks or how that works in practice is that you have to have a state and then this template here will be a function of that state. Now that's all quite abstract, so let's take a look at what that actually looks like. So uh, create a state here. I'll, I'll type it out and then I'll explain what's happening here. So I'll just state for the messages and it'll have a setter for messages and that will be using the use state hook in React. So you might have heard about React hooks at some point. This is a React hook. And we're gonna say that this is a message array specifically. So what we were able to do here is we're able to import a type, an interface, which is exactly the same as what we had in Java, just defined in TypeScript. And that's always automatically uh, generated whenever we change our code. So what all of this here means is use state essentially defines a piece of state. It returns an array with two items in it. And this syntax here destructures that array. So essentially I say, I want to have two, two variables, messages and set messages out of this call. And messages here is the actual state and set messages is a setter for that state. So whenever I use that React knows that the state has changed that it can then go ahead and re-render. So if we now wanted to use these, we could go ahead and do what we had on the slide here. So we could say messages.map, and then for each message, we could return a piece of HTML here. So we could do a list item, for instance, and we could say message dot, and then we can autocomplete and see that, okay, well, we have username, and then we can do a colon, and we can say, message dot text like this. So the, uh, interject another thing. Yeah. I, I work in some TypeScript, some JavaScript now. This is, you can do the autocomplete only because you have TypeScript, which knows exactly what type you're dealing with. There are some really wicked things that IDEs can do to guess what you could get to. Yeah. But I don't trust those. No. <laughs> no, and they certainly like if you change your code, yeah. like yeah. <laughs> they were best guesses while you were typing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, of course, we don't have anything here because we haven't called our backend yet. And because we are in a functional component, they should be kind of without side effects by default. But if we want to actually call a server, we need to define that as a as an effect. So essentially we're saying that we want to call something that causes a side effect in our code. And again, I'll type this out and explain what's happening. So we have two parameters here. One is a function. So this is just a, this is basically a, a Lambda function similar to in Java. And then we have this array of dependencies. And what this means is that anytime anything in this array changes, we want to rerun this in this case, I only want to run it once when we start the application to kind of get the initial set of uh, messages. So that's why I have an empty array here. I don't want it to get called again. What I can do then is I can start typing here. I can see that, yes, I have a chat endpoint here. That's great. Oh, it has messages. That's perfect. What is it that taken? Well, it doesn't take any methods, but it returns a promise of an array of messages. So. It's an asynchronous call, and we can deal with that in two different ways, but I feel for this particular thing, 
the easiest way is to say that whenever that call is completed, then do this thing. So then we want to call set messages with that. So we pass whatever we get from calling this right to the setter here. And let's see what happened here. Something's. Well, you can see that the actual code works, but my ID is angry at me for unknown reasons. Let's see. I don't know why, why it did that, the actual code works, but we could still see we were able to explore the APIs that we had through autocomplete and we were able to kind of get the state initialized and then mapped here. Now I said we have all these different components, so we're going to be using them. So say we wanted to take that same information and display that in a data grid. We could define a grid and say that we'll have a couple of columns here. We'll say path here could be first name. No, I don't even remember what I had. No, it was username. And then we'll have the text here. Let's delete that. And then we can just pass in here the items equal to our messages. And that will take those same objects and put them in a data, uh, data grid like this. Now we're building a chat application and as it happens we have very good components for that particular use case because we have this collaborative uh, or kind of set of UI components for building collaborative UIs. So we have a message list component and we have a message input component which are perfect for what we're doing. So right now we have a empty list here. It's squished all the way here at the top. And then we have this message input. I'm using some of these kind of helper CSS classes that we have here. So I've essentially turned my view here into a flex box, which is a column. And I've made it full height, which means that I can go in here and give this a class name of flex grow to tell it to kind of take up all the extra space that we have in the layout, which pushes the input here to the bottom where we would normally expect it in a chat application. So this is CSS, we're not gonna go super deep into it, but uh, essentially that's what we're abstracting here is a flex box. And then we can uh, say that the items here is equal to our messages, and we can see that our messages show up here. Yes, sir? Is there any LCSS library you recommend with this, with this uh, framework? You could use uh, Tailwind if you like. That's a good one. Essentially, the classes that are here are sort of similar, but they're adapted to the kind of uh, UI library that we have. So there are some things that are kind of sizing that are adapted to what we have. All right. So. Right now we're dealing with a static list of messages and this doesn't really work very well when we have a chat because there are messages coming in all the time and we don't want to keep like asking the server for that list of messages and trying to figure out like what new messages are here and that we need to show. So let's go back to the back end here and change the way it works. And what I want to use are essentially two things out of the Project Reactor library. We're gonna use a flux, which is essentially a data type that is able to return multiple values, essentially more or less like a stream. And then we're gonna use a sync, which is a programmatic way for us to generate that flux. So again, I'll do a little bit of typing and then some explaining. So we're gonna create a sync that returns many values that are of type message, and we'll call this our sync and we'll initialize this with syncs.many.multicast and direct best effort. So we'll do our best here. There are many ways we could deal with things like we have too many messages coming in and we don't know what to do with them. It's not going to be a problem today. And then we're going to have a flux which is the actual thing that people can subscribe to. It's also going to be of type messages and this we can call our chat and that's just gonna be the sync as a flux. 
So we just want to have one instance of this that everyone can subscribe to that way as we add more messages to this uh, sync, everyone will get the same message sent to them. So we're going to remove this old getter that just returned a static list of messages and we're going to change the API up a little bit so that we have a way of subscribing to messages. So for that, I'm going to create a method that returns our flux like this. We'll call this join, for instance, it's a good name. And we're going to return our chat here. And then we need a way of sending messages. So for that, I'm going to create a just a void method called send. And this will take in two things. So it'll take in a username and it'll take in a in a text. And what this will do is it will take the sync and emit a new message on it. So we're going to create a new message that we're going to push onto the sync. And for that, we already have everything that we need. We have the username, we have the text, and we have the time, which is right now. Again, we're going to build this. And what should happen now is whenever we send something here, it's going to get added to the sync. And whoever has joined the chat will automatically get that pushed out to them. Now you can see that this blew up right now. and that actually makes sense because if you uh, if oh, sorry if you think about it, we actually refactored our code. We changed the API. This me method doesn't exist anymore, so we need to deal with that. And really, what that's telling us is that we were able to kind of catch that type of breaking change uh, development time instead of later on. So again, we're going to call the join method here. But the API looks a little bit different now because this, remember, it doesn't return just one value. It returns values over and over again as they're coming in. So we need to add a listener on it, essentially, and decide what we want to do when a new message comes in. We're still going to call the set messages uh, setter for updating the state, but we need to kind of deal with the fact that there is already state from before. So we need to essentially append to that state. The way we do that is by using another kind of version of this, which is takes essentially a functional version that gives us the previous state and then allows us to return a new state that's kind of derived from that. And what we'll do here is we'll create a new array, that's the brackets, then we'll add all the items from that previous array. So essentially this destructures the previous array into it and then as the last item, we had the new message that just came in. Yes. So, like, the same thing in the chat and Java. They're Java, yes. How's it playing out here in the types? So, what happens when you uh, return a flux from a Hilla endpoint is behind the scenes, it will set up a WebSocket for you and send those messages and take care of all of the kind of plumbing for you. So on the client side, it doesn't know anything about a sync or anything. It just knows that I'm gonna, there's a callback and whenever that gets called, I'll deal with the, well, the, with the value that I get from there. All right. And it's actually a good point. So when, when we call this, we actually get a, a subscription object back and if we're, really kind of uh, res uh, responsible programmers, what we'll do is we'll return a, um, let's see what do I do here? Yeah, like that. So essentially we get the subscription and whatever we return here will get called when this view gets dismounted. So that way we'll actually go and close that connection. So you know something gets added to the sink, Yeah, so right now we don't yet have a way of actually pushing things there because we haven't called the send method yet and that's what we need to do next here. So we have the message input here and we're gonna add a listener for the on submit event here and that's gonna give us an event and we're gonna call, we're gonna create a new method called send and that's gonna take in the event uh, detail value 
and we're gonna split this into a new function here and we have the value here we can let's call this text this always trips me up when I do this enough like because the type and the name are in opposite like <laughs> order here but essentially the colon string means that this is a string and you can like if you're you, if you answer that you're familiar with JavaScript but not TypeScript you'll you will have noticed that this is the first time where we actually needed to define a type so it's really good at kind of inferring types based on what you have as input so it looks at your code and it kind of understands that you're dealing with a value of a certain type you don't have to explicitly say it unless you want what's that the types. You already them on the yeah server, but so. you will say if we did a yeah. let x equal one and then we could say x equal b it would not allow that so javascript would be happy to just like all right sure this number is now a letter that makes all kinds of sense but typescript will not let that happen okay so getting back to our example we're gonna again use our chat endpoint and this time we're gonna call send right now we don't have a way of getting the username we're gonna get to that in a while so i'll just use my name here and then the text will be the text that we got in here and if things went well we should be able to say something here hello hit enter and it's going to show up here but obviously that's still kind of boring so let's do another one and that should now get pushed out to all the windows that are subscribed to that same flux so that's the nice thing about having these reactive data types is that when we're dealing with streams of data like multiple instances can subscribe to them uh, when you start kind of looking at bigger reactive systems, you can have all kinds of uh, things in the middle that deal with like what happens if we have too many messages or it could aggregate some of them or do whatever. So there's a lot of kind of things that we can do when we have this type of architecture. Now let's go ahead and fix this so that everyone doesn't have to be Marcus. Yeah, go ahead. What's the warning on the sun? What's that? There seems to be a warning. So it's just letting me know that uh, this is returning a promise that I'm not using. So in this case, since it's a void method, it doesn't really, gotcha. like I, I could, uh, I guess. Marcus, I have a question. Yeah. Um, the server goes down, then the message still gets uh, printed out, uh, after the server went down. It should reconnect within a kind of a reasonable interval like if it goes offline for days and comes back like it's probably not going to work but if it like if you drop your connection you're on the phone and it kind of comes back that should reconnect yeah okay Underlying architecture is software. yeah yeah okay so what we're going to do then is have a way of inputting the username so for that we're going to create a new piece of state and this is again if you haven't worked with a reactive ui library it's a little weird to kind of try to think about how do I define a template that's bound to a piece of state and for this we want to have a new piece of uh, state called user name and then we'll have a set user name for it and in this case we're gonna say that we have a uh, sorry no use state all right and we're going to initialize this with an empty string. In this case, we don't have to like specify the type because it TypeScript is perfectly kind of capable of understanding that since it's initialized with a string, it's always needs to be a string. And uh, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to do one additional state for an input. And we're going to, we're going to show you why in just a second. So. Typically, when we're dealing with input, we want to have a bound input value where we're kind of maintaining the state of a text field as well separately. The idea is that if this ever disappeared, you should always be able to reconstruct it based on the values that you have in your state. So what we can do then is one of my favorite things in TypeScript, which is do a kind of a nullish check here. So if, if our username is not, so that'll check for null or undefined or empty or 
pretty much everything that you don't want it to be. So if that's the case, then we'll actually gonna go ahead and return a different template. And I'm gonna create a div here. And what I wanna do is essentially have a little centered login screen here. And for that, I'm gonna give this some of those same class names. So we're gonna turn this into a Flexbox. We're gonna set the height to full. We're gonna set the item centered and justified, which means in both X and Y axis, we want it center, whatever we put in here. And then we're gonna do a flex with a small gap here for the components. Here I'm gonna use a text field and a button. These are all coming from the button library. I'm gonna give this a theme of primary and say join. And that should show up here. So we can give this a placeholder, say username, and that shows up here. So now we wanna take this text field and bind it to this input value here. And the way I do that is first, I need to bind the state into the field. So I'll say that the value is input, and then we need to bind the changes back to the state. So we'll say on change, and then we get an event from there and we're going to call set input with the target which is the text fields value like this so this looks a little verbose because we're doing it all by hand typically you would use maybe a library to do this but we're going to stick to just plain vanilla react here yes sir yeah the gentleman over has an interesting question about the server is there some sort of circuit breaker i think you might have been dealing with the input up here so what? Meaning that, like for example, if you had like, let's say you're working with a, you know, back end of your front end, the back end goes down, the front end may have a default object that just prints out a message. You, yeah, you could deal with that here in the front end code if you wanted to. So, it's a, yeah, good point, but. but no, I'm just curious, is there any abstract? It seems like there's no abstraction to that there. So, yeah, we can look at it, but essentially, hill apps, you can turn them into progressive web apps, meaning that you, essentially it will help you cache everything on the client side uh, locally, which means that the client side could continue working even if the server is offline. And really what you would have to do then as a developer is to define what should happen when you're offline. The chat doesn't make a whole lot of sense offline probably, so probably nothing much will happen. But for other applications, you might be able to like, say if you have a, like a CRUD editor, you might still be able to view the content you just can't edit or then you can add new content because you could flush those to the server once you get a uh, connection. Whereas like doing full, full on edit becomes a whole lot more risky because then you need to start dealing with merges and it's not something you want to probably so do. Progressive web apps would be the way to go, what you think? Yeah, if you want to have some offline functionality and that's something that we uh, support out of the box here, so. All right, All right. so, okay, let's see, so. And then what I want to do is here in my send method, we're going to use the username state here instead. And just to kind of show what this actually means is that our, since our input state is bound to this text field here, if I change this to something, you'll see that that actually gets reflected here. So whatever's in the template is always kind of uh, dependent on what we have in our state. All right, so let's go ahead and log in here. And of course that doesn't work because we don't actually do anything on the button click. So on click, let's call join. Let's do a new function here. Join's gonna be super simple. So we're gonna set the username to whatever the input value is. No. Stupid. All right. And then what we could do if we wanted to is we can set the input back to an empty string. So now if I click join here, we're gonna get back to the original UI here because now username is no longer null or something similar to that. So we're gonna get this template here. And sorry, Marcus, we go here. Now I'm gonna do another one here. And this will be our friend Bob. And now we can actually 
have multiple people chatting here with their own names. All right, so that's the general flow of this. So on our back end, we're working with these fluxes and sinks and stuff. Like in a real application, you'd probably push this actually outside of your own server. It might go into a message queue or I don't know, a stream of some sort, Pulsar, Kafka, whatever. But in this case, we're gonna just, the data types work the same, regardless of if it goes to the internet or not. All right, so I, I mentioned that I did a little chat GBT integration here because I thought I had to go head to head with Venkat. So let's take a look at how that works. So what if we wanted to add a AI person into the chat here to chat with? So for that, I'm using, or I created a service here. And because we're in a Spring Boot application, I'm able to use the Spring web client here. And I'm essentially doing a client that calls the OpenAI API. I have the API key defined in my environment as an environment variable. And what this essentially just does is it calls that and then it extracts that correct uh, response from there. So it, I created this ChatGPT response class that it serializes. And with that, what we can do is, let's go here and do a funnel ChatGPT service like this, and then we'll auto wire this in. So we're using Spring Boot's auto wiring to get a instance of the service. The service actually, I didn't show that. So that essentially uses the client and then it keeps track of the history of messages so that we can have like an ongoing discussion with it. So what we can do then is here, after somebody sends a message, we can say that, uh, let's go here, what did I call it? Service, it's a stupid name. Yes, okay. So ChatGPT service, get answer for that text. And then this is, again, we're using web client, which is also a reactive API. So we can subscribe to the answer there. That way our server doesn't like hang on this waiting for it. It'll actually do other things while this is going on. And once that happens, we can essentially do the same code. We're gonna emit a new message. Well, let's see. Let's try to actually get this to compile. Okay, so we get our, an answer back after a little while, and then we can do a new message. This will be from Charles G. T and we'll say answer and we'll build this and if things go well we'll be able to go in here say hey there and solid <laughs> and for the record i'm using light theme here because it just is so much easier to read on a bad projector so. <laughs> all right so that's essentially it um just a little show so i mean once you have these reactive things you can kind of plug and play and and you don't have anything that's kind of blocking on the server so you're able to handle a, a whole lot of people at the same time all right so Last thing I wanted to show you is something that I was actually working with Josh Long on this uh, over or in January, where kind of they had just released Spring Boot 3, and that comes with support for AOT compilation for Graal VM. So that's a lot of acronyms. So AOT compilation essentially means that Spring Boot will start up the application and kind of inspect what what is it using right now? What do we need to include in a native image and then it takes that information and it passes it to the Graal VM compiler which will then compile our Java into an actual binary for our architecture. So what we had to do was add just a couple of hints for data types that are specific to our uh, framework and what I needed to do for my uh, 
for my code here is I had to tell GraalVM here that I'll actually be using a reflection for this chat GPT response when it's serializing that. So that's the only line of code that I had to add here for support. Yes, sir? Yeah, you mentioned something kind of surprising. You take a Spring Boot and you use the Growl, it had to go and look for all the uh, parts. Mm -hmm. No, but the, I, I would have gave that same answer to Spring Boot, but it's a difference. I mean, to me, that's what Spring Boot application does. You give it a, you know, you give it a project that goes find all the classes you need for it. You know, like if you need a Tomcat server, stuff like that. So those are kind of, yeah, those are the kind of Java dependencies it needs when it's running. So this is actually looking at what are the actual like classes that your application is using runtime and make sure that those are available also in, in a statically compiled environment. So what we're gonna do for this is we're gonna do a production build. So this is Hilla specific, that essentially we wanna do a really optimized, minimized uh, version of the client-side bundle, no debug logging and any of that. And the native uh, profile comes from Spring and that comes with this native compile target. Now, this takes a little while because it actually, like I said, it starts the application, it looks at it, it does a whole lot of things and we'll see here. All right, so now we can see the Hill app ran there for a sec and in a little while, we're, we're going to start seeing the Graal VM native image compilation happening here. So it has seven stages. So it'll do all kinds of stuff. At some point, it says building universe. That's when you're getting close to the <laughs> final end result here. So this will typically take, right, I think on my computer, just over a minute. If you have a big application, it'll take significantly longer. But what you gain is incredibly much faster startup speeds when you're actually in production and it uses a whole lot less memory as well so we'll let this run if anyone has a question while this is running uh yes sir so this is a, in a way a little bit like the tree shaping on the essentially state, right? it, it's a little bit yeah. yeah yeah so it really tries to kind of understand like it doesn't want to include the entire jvm in a native binary because it would be enormous and that would not be ideal how does it deal with some of the like, reflections? Because with, with Java, it's not that obvious. What no, so using. that's yeah. So that's what we were working on. Like on the fra framework side, we added like everything the framework needs reflection for. You can give it some hints, like hey, you're gonna need these, so just be sure to include those. And that's why I had to add this in my own code, saying like hey, I'm gonna. By the way, I'm gonna need this runtime, so just make sure that's available to me. All right, so we're building the universe, parsing methods, inlining them, compiling, creating an image. And finally, one minute and 42 seconds later, it's done. So obviously that takes a whole lot longer than just a normal kind of Java compile. But what's really cool here now is if we start the application, let's do that again in case you blinked. So. The application started in 0 0.083 seconds, so 8.3 milliseconds. It's pretty good for a job app. And if we run the application, there should not be any difference. It should work just the same. So the jokes should be just equally as bad as they were before. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, yeah, let's see, where's the chat GPT? The reason it's telling really bad jokes is I, I gave here in the system prompt, I gave it a system prompt of really? liking to tell jokes and use puns. It's solid. I, I very much like these. Anyway, so not only does it start quick, but it's also very kind of memory efficient so this application uses just over 100 megs of ram so what this means is that it becomes kind of very kind of easy and cheap to kind of scale up and down these nodes because like if they can start in eight milliseconds plus whatever your container startup time is you don't have like for most like normal latencies you could essentially spin up a new server while somebody 
like after somebody clicks and they won't notice a, a difference and that's pretty cool yes I went to the AWS conference and they were talking about starting servers before the Docker image is completely loaded. Yeah. Is that related to this in any way? Not as far as I'm. So you would probably put this in a Docker container or something else, like where you, you would run that image. Or... Yeah, because I, I can't imagine how do they do that. How, how, do you, how are they able to start the, your server before the image is fully loaded, like downloaded? I don't know. That sounds like black magic sorcery to me. Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. Um, if you want to continue poking around on the app that we just built together, you can find it on my GitHub. So again, slash Marcus Helberg, and then he'll uh, react to the chat. Or you can use the QR code. Uh, maybe Jim, you can share the link on, mm -hmm. on the group as well. Question. Yes. So no need to retry. Let's just say that this is not necessarily like production code as much as like try to keep things simple so they're easy to understand. But I mean, it wouldn't be all that much different, but. Sometimes when I open up ChatGPT, it sometimes gets spiraled or something. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely, like in a, in a real application, you probably want to deal with all kinds of exceptions. All right, very good. So let's do Q&A. Uh, I can answer some of these and again, feel free to answer or kind of ask in person as well. So how will Hilla code generation work if I have multiple separate projects for the middleware as well as multiple projects for the micro front ends? Mm. Could you give me a little bit more information? Are these sure, like yeah. so, so multiple modules have, or multiple? multiple projects in the middleware, right? So you have libraries, like mm. frameworks, that are being developed, that are being used in, in your middleware, mm -hmm. uh, which bring in their own types and things like that, yeah. which then have a correspondent in the front end, right? Uh, you can have different libraries, jars, that bring in different REST endpoints, right? Yeah. Use different endpoints. Yeah. And then on the front end, you can have micro front ends that are individually developed by different things. Yeah. but all come together into the same yeah. UI, right? Yeah. So my question is, in those cases, how will you deal with, uh, with the type generation, right? The, this glue between the front end and the yeah. middleware. Yeah, so these, you can think of Hill applications as kind of a, a, a back end for front end pattern where essentially you have that topmost layer of your back end is glued on top of the front end. So you would essentially, you could build each microservice as a Hill application in that case. And now if they need to use types across like between projects, would they, how would they be able to do that? Cross projects? It's, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer okay. right now. I can ask the team for more. Probably have to use the aggregator pattern. Yeah. Where you aggregate all your microservices into one service and then you can share the types across them from your aggregated right version. okay so you have like a super project that right. publishes the types right yeah. and it and and you can still make it failure safe so that if one microservice goes down it doesn't go belly up for the whole thing but that's that that operation lives to the back end so that it can decide what to do with that one all right. Thank you. Okay, so then we had a question on chat view. So I guess this is asking if the then is a blocking. So, well, we don't have that anymore here, but essentially then is then is using the promise API. So it's just give the what you pass into then is essentially a callback for whenever that completes. So it's not a blocking call. It's essentially adding a callback for whenever it's done in the future. When it's resolved. The exactly. Does Hilla support recursive data structures? It should, yes. Uh, is there also support to stream messages from the front end to the middleware? Even better, have WebSocket that supports bidirectional communication. That's something that we have on the on the backlog, having kind of bidirectional WebSocket for now. This is kind of 
just kind of uh, XHR requests in and then WebSockets out. But uh, that's a good good point and, and something that we do have on our kind of backlog of things that we're looking into. Good. Any other questions I can answer? Obviously, I'll be around here like after it if you have anything that you want to ask that's very specific to what you're doing or something you don't want to like have it ask here in front of everyone. All right, so hopefully what we're able to see is that Hilla really is mostly just a standard Spring Boot project with a standard React front end where we added just this tiny bit of magic glue in between to make them kind of work for us one cohesive project for better, both better developer experience and kind of easier maintainability. If you want to learn, yes. So Hilla is specifically like the initial target group that we have in mind when we built this is more like full stack teams where you have either developers who themselves like to work in multiple languages or more of a team where you have both like front end and back end developers working together. We're certainly kind of exploring other options where these could be more separate and still maintain this uh, kind of type safety net, but we wanted to kind of start with kind of one use case and validate that the idea works and the kind of everything that we have makes sense before we start kind of trying to generalize it too much. Anyway, so yeah, you can find uh, docs and uh, getting started guides on hilla.dev. And if you wanna get in touch with me later on, if you have any questions that pop into your head, you can find me on Twitter, uh, probably the best way of reaching me. I am on Mastodon, if you can figure out which server, I forgot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you all for coming. So nice to see you all. I might find you on a cold mountaintop. Yes, <laughs> hopefully soon. Like We've gotten a lot of snow in California this year, yeah. so it, it'll be like winter conditions until yeah. August at least. Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. I have no idea about, about this. It's the first time I hear about it. So oh, it's fun.